4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia. And we are telling their stories. On this edition, Detox Temple. Inside a Buddhist sanctuary in Thailand with a unique method for drug rehabilitation. Helping the homeless. A group of Indians gives street dwellers a helping hand and a makeover. And from scavenging to dancing. Meet some children from Manila's slums whose lives are changing because of ballet. I'm Tony Cheng and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the show. On this episode, we'll be telling you stories of hope and transformation. We begin in Thailand, where people addicted to drugs, drink, and other vices are undergoing transformation in a Buddhist temple. I traveled to Wat Tham Krabok, hundreds of kilometers to the northeast of Bangkok, and witnessed its unusual way of detoxifying and transforming its patients. Set deep in the hills of central Thailand, an isolated Buddhist sanctuary. A unique order of forest monks with an expert knowledge of the plants and herbs in the jungles they roam. The temple is now a center of global renown with a controversial treatment that claims to be effective in treating addiction. But the monks also have a weapon, a potion brewed from a secret recipe with the power to purge. Wat Tham Krabok is a rather unconventional Buddhist temple, founded in the late 50s by a woman disguised as a monk. The Thai government had just banned opium dens at the time. Thousands of addicts were left suffering from withdrawal. The abbot known as Luang Po devised a treatment using herbal remedies, rehabilitating the patient's minds as well as bodies. หลวงพ่อท่านก็เลยทําสูตรยาขึ้นมาเพื่อที่จะรักษาเขาซึ่งจริงๆแล้วเพื่อนเพทางครอบครัวหลวงพ่อเนี่ยก็จะมีเอ
By their side is a bucket of water and a cup. The monks work their way down the line. Each patient is given a shot glass of a thick, dark liquid, the secret detoxification potion. People say, just hold your nose and drink it, but I don't know, I, I've, drink, I've been drinking it. It hasn't done me any harm sometimes, it's strong or um, it's not something I'd, anything like I drink back home, you know. It has an almost instantaneous effect. Afterwards, does it make you feel better? No. No. The potion's brewed from a secret recipe of more than 100 wild plants and herbs. Exact quantities and extraction methods are a secret that takes years to learn. These are then stewed for days in a huge urn, eventually producing a pungent liquid with what the monks say is the power to detox the most hardened addict. Okay, well, this is, this is the thing. Ooh, it's pretty hot. A little bit warm, yeah. A little bit warm. Um, <coughs> and this is not the medicine that makes the patients vomit. It's a, it's a much watered down version, but let's give it a try. It's supposed to have amazing health benefits. Mm. It's, it's rather bitter, I have to say. Um, but they say that if you continue to drink this, It'll get rid of all the toxins in your body and you'll slowly start to recover from any sicknesses you're suffering from. Ooh, <laughs> it is bitter. <laughs> the same herbal remedy is used at the temple sauna, where patients are encouraged to sweat out the toxins they've ingested. But is there any science behind this treatment and any way of proving its effectiveness? Dr. Virat, Thailand's foremost expert in drug rehabilitation, has seen tens of thousands of patients with all sorts of addictions. Although he thinks there's no danger from the temple's detox potion, he says it's more for the mind than the body. So, like a belief or psychological effect. In what Dr. Mabok, it seems to be like a cold turkey in the old fashion. But uh, the safety and it's important to when, when using this style of, of the treatment. As for the temple's claims of a 90% success rate, he's a bit more skeptical. People only want chance to treatment. So they cannot come again. So we not know they relapse or not after that. Sasha is a Russian monk who works with the foreign patients. He came to the temple as an addict himself and he agrees that it was the treatment for his psychological state that really made the difference. When I stop use things what kill myself, when I stop use many, many poisonous things, my uh, reason grow up and uh, I start thinking about uh, things, about action truthfully. Ricky's been living in this shared dormitory since he entered the program. He was using drugs until the day he arrived. But since then, he's had nothing to help with his withdrawal. It's one of the hard and fast rules of the temple. Addiction must be cured with the power of the mind alone. No medicine at all, no, nothing. Not even paracetamol? No, even paracetamol, nothing. The monks gather every morning for breakfast, their only meal of the day. When the meal's finished, the patients wash the dishes and clean up. When I was in trucks, I used to do nothing, you know, it's everything I wanted to do, I was lazy and you're thinking, oh no, make it later, later, and so you learn how to get a routine, a daily routine in your life. It may not seem like much, but for these addicts, it's the first step on the road to normality. Getting people clean in a remote setting is one thing. But what about the temptation of the outside world? For many reformed addicts, this is where the real danger of relapse lies. Ricky thinks the temple's given him the strength to clean up, so that when that moment comes, he can resist. Before I'd say no, you know what I mean? I, I could even see myself if I go back 
home or something, I go back in the same thing. But now I'm stronger, you know? The longer I stay here, the, the stronger I, I got. The temple has just one basic rule. Patients can go through the program only once. If they do relapse, then they must seek help elsewhere. For most patients who've traveled down the difficult path of addiction, however, this is already the end of the road. The monks running the rehabilitation program say that they can only do 5% of the work. The rest has to come from the patients themselves as they struggle to free themselves from addiction. Homeless people are all over India's city of Hyderabad, a visible sign of poverty in the world's largest democracy. But instead of arms, a group of volunteers have decided to offer them a physical makeover instead, offering free services like a bath and a haircut. Rwanda Bawa went to meet the young people whose generosity is transforming not only the street people's lives, but their own as well. Every Sunday on the busy streets of Hyderabad, members of Yangistan India scout for their target. They call themselves the Transformers. And their search is on until they find what they are looking for. Yadgiri is a homeless beggar who has not bathed for a long time. He's been living on the streets for three years and says he was deserted by his family when he lost most of his eyesight. The two boys convince Yadgiri to go under their knife. But it's not a surgical operation, it's a makeover. The tools are out and the stage is set. People stop to see what's going on. It's time for the transformation to begin. <laughs> Yadgiri is trimmed and shaved and then he gets ready for a bath arranged by the boys. After about 45 minutes, Yadgiri emerges, clean and happy with his makeover. He's a new man. Swaroop and Praveen are members of Yangistan India, an organization that helps the drowned trodden develop a better outlook on life. Every weekend, young professionals and students come together to volunteer. You're there with us for six weeks, we get the ID card. And we go and spend time with the homeless on the streets, giving them a haircut and... Uh... About 1,000 volunteers have registered so far, and the group is attracting more and more all the time. Ravinder survives on one meal a day. He rides for two hours on a train to Hyderabad every week to get a clean and free shave by the Transformers.
But the transformations are not one-sided. Some of the volunteers themselves go through unexpected experiences. Swaroop, who has his own business, says he's a different person today. He joined the group two years back. In the past, I used to be so much proudish and attitude. Bot ganda tha man. Ek jine ko respect nahi karta anta. Elders bol ke respect nahi, chote bache bol ke respect nahi, kuch bhi nahi tha. Jengistan me join hone ke baad ek circle paida hua mere paas. Mujhe to ek circle naya circle aaya, naye log, naye friends. Wo circle se pura change ho gaya. Within fraction of weeks, change ho gaya mera. Kya mera mindset bhi change ho gaya tha. Come 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 come. Arun Yelamati is one of Youngistan India's four founding members, all friends who came together to help the homeless and destitute. We started by giving food, you know, um, it's very important. We, we know that once we give food to them, we believe we, there is a need more for them, you know, there is only food cannot finish their cost of living. So once we start giving them food, we notice the need is more in them. Volunteers pay 100 rupees a month or about a dollar fifty to take part. With these small donations, Youngistan India can stay afloat, but sometimes the lack of money is obvious. But still, the volunteers are able to touch many lives. The group is overflowing with energy and comes up with new ideas all the time. <laughs> Using funds from volunteers and from donations, they prepare food for downtrodden every weekend. Those who never entered their own kitchens have become culinary specialists. Once the food is ready, it is packed and distributed by the so-called hunger heroes. While the transformers operate during the day, the hunger heroes come out in the dark. They are ready to roll on the roads as the sun sets with the food that they have cooked for the hungry to be fed so that they do not sleep hungry in the night. Distribution of cooked food goes on till late in the night. Even though most volunteers have to go to their regular jobs the next day, they ensure that the poor get their share of food. And as the sun rises, the city prepares for another day. Every morning on the same street where Yadgiri lives, people just like him are hoping for something good to come along and change their lives. But then reality hits again, and they are still in the state of destitution. That's when the volunteers of Youngistan India step in to make a difference in their lives. For Assignment Asia, I am Ravinder Baba in Hyderabad, India. The volunteers hope to raise enough funds to expand their services in other cities in India and open a free skills training center to homeless people. Ballet is traditionally considered to be an elite art form. But in the Philippines, it's becoming a vehicle for some poor children to get out of the slums. From Manila, Barnaby Lowe tells the story of two young children who are getting the chance for a better life through ballet. It's been seven years since 17-year-old Jessa Bolote first graced the stage. But she says sometimes it still feels like a dream. It is, and tonight she's a star, dancing with the rest of Ballet Manila for a preview of their performance at the 2015 Asian Grand Prix in Hong Kong. But Jessa says she never imagined she'd be here one day. Her journey has been nothing short of a fairy tale. Naiisip mo, magkakarating ka, nakakawin ka dito. Kung gano'n nakalayo yung buhay mo ngayon sa buhay mo natin. Opo. Anong po talaga? Parang ibang-ibang po talaga. These are the slums of Manila's Tondo District. 
one of the world's most densely populated communities. It's where Jessa grew up and where her family still lives. So, nakikita mo yung mga tao dito pag umuwi ka, nakikita mo yung mga bata dito. Naisip mo yung buhay mo dati? Opo, para pong nakikita ko yung ako yung dati na kung ano pong ginagawa lang po nila. Parang na, natutuwa ako, sabi ko, wow, parang dati lang ay yung ginagawa ko. Ano ba yung buhay mo dati? Pwede mo pahikwento sa ano? Nung bago ka nagsimula magbali? Um, buhay ko po talaga po dati, yung magulang ko po nang huwa po ng basura. So, ang ginagawa ko lang po, tumutulog po sa kanila, sakali man pong wala po kung gano'ng ginagawa po sa school, yung mga, wala po kung gano'ng mga projects. Masama po sa lakad na tuwing gabi po, nakikisabaw ko pa huwa po ng basura, pa humulot. Women housing that, you know? The few dollars they made each night, they had to scrimp to be able to feed their family of fate. Ah! Ayun niyo, ayun, nako. Puro ano pala ni Jessa. From a young age, Jessa seemed to know exactly what she needed to do to lift herself and her family out of poverty. She knew she needed to be educated, so she applied for a scholarship. When she got it, she knew she needed to study well. What she didn't know at the time was that fate had carved out a slightly different path for her. Mahilig ka talaga sa buhay ako? Opo. Pero yung bali? Hindi po. Wala ka alam? Wala po akong alam doon. Sa school po kasi namin, kasi nga po scholar nga po siya ng bali po. So, pa, nagkaroon po siya ng one time po ng field trip. So, lahat po kami nanood. So, nakapanood po, first time ko po manood po ng bali, pinokyo po. Hindi pa po ako nagbabalik niyo. So, parang na, na ano po ako na, na mangha. The donor Jessa was referring to is Ballet Manila one of the Philippines' premier ballet companies. The brainchild of the country's prima ballerina, Lisa Makuha Elizalde. Lisa made a name in the international ballet scene in the 1980s when she became the first foreign soloist of the prestigious Kirov Ballet of Russia. When she returned to the Philippines, she continued to dance. She made it her mission to bring ballet to the people and people to ballet. I started to perform in the provinces, in basketball courts, in cockpit arenas, in on the streets, on top of soft drink cases that they would nail together. You know, um, because you know, Anna Pavlova did it in her time. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Russian, the great Russian ballet dancers would go all the way to the front to to dance on uh, on ground that was just covered by by canvas in mm. order to entertain the soldiers. You know, I, I wanted that kind of uh, reach for my art. She collaborated with other Filipino ballet artists and trained new dancers. Ballet Manila was born. Two of the company's first dancers, Lisa taught at her parents' house pro bono. In 2008, she institutionalized the program and called it Project Ballet Futures. Here in the Philippines, ballet is often seen as high art, a dance common folks are not accustomed to watch, much less be a part of. But that is what this school, led by the country's prima ballerina herself, is trying to change. We added the benefits for the scholars. We started to give them um, nutritious meals, vitamins, milk, um, we gave them equipment and we started getting them in at a younger age. We started mm. getting them in at eight, nine, ten years old. One of the first auditions was held at Jessa's school. Jessa didn't think she had what it takes to become a ballet dancer, but she tried anyway. Parang natakot ako yung nakabahan kasi parang hindi, parang hindi talaga sa akin yun. Kasi hindi ko talaga akalain na makakapasok ako. Kasi siguro din po nakapasok ko dahil sa grade ko po sa school. Mataas po mga marka ko. But Lisa saw promise in Jessa from the very beginning. She was a combination of talent, dedication, commitment, hard work, and she also had, of course, the, uh, the body and the, the strength, the resistance, mm -hmm. and the grit and determination to continue training and continue to progress in leaps and bounds. Jessa is now a full-fledged company dancer. She gets paid performing in different cities around the world. 
Bally Manila also lets her stay in this apartment for free. So most of what she earns goes to her family. Hindi ko po kalain na yung opportunity ko po na bibigyan po ng sa pagkasayaw po, ayun po, nakakatulong po sa pamilya ko. Sa pang-araw-araw po na pagsasayaw po ng balay, nabibigyan ko po sila ng ano, tulong po kahit po paano. So hindi ko po kalain na sa ilad ko po ngayon po na nakakatulong po sa pamilya ko. Parang masaya po lahat po na ibibigay ko po sa kanila. Yung mga dapat hindi ko po dapat pong gawin, na, nabibig, nagagawa ko na po. Many have since followed in Jessa's footsteps, including 13-year-old Brian Sevilla. Like Jessa, he was handpicked from a school audition. Hindi ko po alam na bali po pala yung in-audition ko dati. Akala ko po, ano, sayo-sayo lang. Tapos nalaman ko po na bali pala yung audition, kaya na-shock po ako kasi parang ang hirap po maging bali. Pero tinuloy mo na rin? Apa. Bakit? Kasi... Gus, dat, dati po parang na-amiss po ako pag may nakita pong mga bali, bali dancer kasi parang ang, ang gagaling po ng mga ginagawa nilang tricks. Parang gusto ko rin po maranasan niyo. Brian hasn't looked back since. He juggles school and ballet rehearsals and occasionally gets to travel for competitions and shows. Lisa says talents like them give hope to the future of ballet in the Philippines. We are babies compared to, say, you know, Russia, where the art is more than 300 years old. So, um, yeah, we have a lot of catching up to do, but I think we're um, already doing it um, one day at a time, one step at a time. Both Jessa and Brian plan to make a career out of ballet, one that may not end up as legendary as their mentor, Lisa Mokuhas, but one that could pave the way for more Filipino talents to dance their way out of poverty. For Simon Asia, I'm Barnaby Lowe in Manila. Jessa and Brian both received citations at the 2015 Asian Grand Prix International Ballet Competition in Hong Kong. And Ballet in Manila continues to receive donations to support and shape the future of scholars like them. You can learn more about this and all the other stories on today's program at our website, www.assignment-asia.com. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Tony Cheng. Thanks for watching, and join us again on Assignment Asia.